Mm. Well, <coughs> I, will con I would like to continue now a discussion of uh, uh, various types of interactions. And it is really important part because uh, interactions, uh, proper analysis of interactions uh, allows us really to predict the future. By looking at the object, we can figure out how this object is interacting with the environment and from then we can predict what the object is going to do. Um, well, <sighs> last week I um, um, discussed the interaction on the microscopic uh, level, although as engineers uh, you will probably never think about uh, microscopic interactions, most likely you will have about combination of those four interactions which result in a, uh, well, interaction between objects, not between particles, because those four are between particles. Um, well, <coughs> although gra gravitational and electrostatic interaction also can, well, in principle all four uh, are between objects, gravitational and electrostatic interaction can exist even between uh, relatively large objects. Uh, well, it won't be convenient, however, every time to go to those uh, f uh, basic forces. So um, we will discuss today a combination of those forces which uh, manifest themselves um, as, well, a different kind of a different force, although it is not a different force. We will just give a name for a set of interactions, uh, um, just to simplify the analysis. Um, and, uh, well, the first subject I want to talk is weight, um, which is actually kind of a very difficult concept because um, it's not exactly force. Um, we very often confuse weight with gravitational force, and gravitational force is the force which, which really exists in nature. Weight actually is a concept which results from a combination of gravitational in, uh, inter interaction and something which we are going to learn in the future, non-inertiality of a reference frame. So, uh, uh <coughs> actually, why don't you repeat the word? Non-inertiality of a reference frame, say it, a phrase. Good, uh -huh. because uh, we will learn, for example, that weight is different on the equator and uh, different on the uh, on the pole, and it is not uh, related just with the fact that uh, Earth is not spherical, but also that it rotates. So that effect of rotation is imposed also on the uh, on on weight, and the best uh, example where you can uh, distinguish those two is in a spacecraft orbiting, uh, orbiting the Earth. Because, uh, well, if it is orbiting the Earth, there is gravitational er uh, force exerted on the astronaut inside the spacecraft, but that astronaut in that spacecraft is weightless, right? So weight is, uh, is uh, zero. All right. Uh, we define weight in any reference frame actually as a product of mass of the object and, and acceleration due to gravity at the location of the object and in a particular reference frame. So if we want to figure out weight of an object in the classroom, let's say my weight. I have, therefore, I have to multiply my mass by acceleration due to gravity. And acceleration due to gravity in this room will be, ac would be, ac or is, the acceleration of an object which is subjected only to gravitational interaction. So obviously it is not my uh, acceleration because I'm not subjected to, to single gravitational interaction. Floor is interacting with me. However, if I take the bo this ball, for example, and release it, if I uh, ignore the fact that Earth, os Earth os uh, was also interacting with that ball, 
I can, uh, well, but that interaction was relatively small, particularly com uh, if we compare it with the gravitational interaction. So I may assume that when after I release the ball, it is subjected only to gravitational interaction and its acceleration is due to gravity. Therefore, I multiply, I have to multiply my mass by the acceleration of that ball in order to get my weight. Make sure that you do not multiply by acceler my acceleration. Whenever we, we uh, uh, determine weight, we have to multiply mass by acceleration due to gravity, not acceleration of that object. Um, and make sure that, that this uh, coefficient w by which we multiply apply is called acceleration due to gravity, not gravity. Why not? Because gravity is the name of the interaction, correct. Well, it happens that on Earth, because and, it, and the reason for it is that we spin relatively slowly, it happens that acceleration due to gravity is equal to the gravitational field vector which we discussed uh, before. Uh, now, and because of that, uh, we will use the same symbol for the uh, gr uh, gravitational field vector and for uh, acceleration due to gravity. Uh, actually, if you look at the cover of the book, uh, where the various constants are listed, this uh, G uh, refers to acceleration due to gravity rather than uh, strength of gravitational field. Uh, now, however, on the, uh, in the book, uh, you have uh, only magnitude of this vector is listed. So it is a regular G, not bold G, and without an arrow. And, uh, and uh, the, the value given is 9.8 meters uh, per uh, second uh, square. All right, now, you, I have already mentioned that, but when you are in a spacecraft, flying around the Earth, uh, then I, uh, if I release that ball, if I were in a spacecraft and I would release that ball, that ball would hang over here, right? So, so uh, its acceleration due to gravity would be zero in that non-inertial reference frame. Uh, we will learn in the future why it is, oh, actually, my bit is, uh, we can even recognize that that there is something wrong with Newton's second law in the spacecraft. Uh, because, uh, well, if you, think about, if you think about an astronaut, uh, let's try to find out what forces are exerted. What he, if he is subject, or he or she is subjected to what type of interactions? What interacts with them? Uh, Earth, right? So Earth is pulling it. What else? Well, I mean, if it is floating, then then how? I mean, it doesn't it doesn't touch. I mean, unless, unless you include also gravitational interaction. Well, nothing. It's just one. There is just one gravitational force exerted on it, and acceler and acceleration of that person is in the spacecraft. Is in the spacecraft. Yes, in the spacecraft, it's zero. Well, doesn't it violate Newton's second law? Newton's second law, and let me say it in a very sloppy way, uh, says force equals mass times acceleration. We figured out that acceleration is zero, uh, mass of this astronaut is not, not zero, and uh, force is not zero. How come? Isn't, isn't Newton's second law violated? Who believes that it is violated? Who believes that it isn't? How do you believe that it isn't violated? Oh well, no, you can't violate them. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, it uh, it is that I from time to time we discover something which violates, and then we have to change uh, to change the law. However, this situation does not violate. Indeed, does not violate. And 
well, uh, show me that it doesn't violate. Because obviously, here, force is not equal to mass times acceleration. What phrase in Newton's second law saves it? In an inertial reference frame. Spacecraft does not constitute an inertial reference frame. So in, in a non-inertial reference frame, anything can happen. All right. <coughs> Uh, so f for the micros and and uh, as engineer IT, you probably will be will use more frequently weight than gravitational force. Although remember that on Earth, in the reference frame of the classroom, they are practically the s uh, it's practically the same the same force. Uh, by the way, on the on the orbit, I mean let's say 100 kilometers above the surface. The gravitational force is still almost the same as here. It is 90 f about 95 percent of the force here because the distance from the center changed, from the center of Earth to the to the uh, object changed a little bit, so that force decreased to 95. The magnitude of this force decreases to 95 percent of its value on the uh, on the uh, surface. All right, now. If we put an object on a rigid surface, then this rigid surface is going to react. Uh, really, what? Well, I mean, it it depends, uh, and we don't even have to uh, to to place it on the rigid surface as long as two as uh, rigid surfaces in contact with with, with something. Uh, so, for example, I can, if I lean against the wall now the wall is also exerting the, that force. So whenever a rigid surface is in contact with something, then uh, I mean very often the, these are two rigid surfaces, but they don't have to be. If I, if I had a droplet, droplet of water on my palm, then the palm would also exert that, uh, that force. Uh, often this force is also referred to as a support force, support force would make even more sense than normal force except that well normal the the the, the probably normal force uh, phrase normal force is more popular because it indicates the direction this force is always exerted perpendicularly to the surface the most common misconception or error which students do is that the normal force is opposite to weight it's not true it depends on the situation um, so normal force is going to be perpendicular to the surface of the contact uh, the normal force prevents objects from crossing the surface therefore it depends on the other forces exerted on that object um, I like, I, mean, I don't know where I read it, but uh, somebody referred to normal force as, a, as one of the smart forces. It adjusts itself depending to the, to the situation. Um, well, let's now think about, um, well, uh, no, let's uh, just do so, so that the analysis is a little bit more confusing. Uh, how about if I go through uh, through two uh, through, through another uh, interaction? Yes. Yeah, so if we have a situation that only those two forces are exerted on an inclined surface, that if we add those two, we will get a non-zero uh, 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 value of the net force, and therefore this block would accelerate. It would slide along the ramp. All right. Now, uh, you can think about a static frictional uh, force, which is also a, a smart force, as the other component to the normal force. So normal force together with static frictional force uh, represent the force which is exerted by the rigid surface. A normal force is in perpendicular direction. Static frictional force is always parallel to the uh, to the uh, surface and it adjusts itself so depending on it also it is also smart 
uh, and uh, it is also smart and depends on the other uh, on the other uh, forces you can if you look at kind of microscopic this isn't really microscopic but friction really r results from unevenness of the two surfaces so on that scale you can recognize that friction is a result of a normal force exerted by the unevenness of the of the two surfaces so in order to make uh, to to reduce static friction which we don't want to do by the way because i know that uh, uh, common conception is that friction is bad and we want to we wa we lubricate things to reduce friction not always and static friction is very important you would not get out from that room without static friction you need it we need static friction to to make uh, objects move as well uh, now st uh, st static friction requires that the surfaces don't slide and and here is also uh, this is also a, a source of misconception uh, very often people recognize that for example that well if a if an object moves then the, then the, there is a static friction between object and uh, and the surface it's not true it has to slide so for example when the ball is rolling the contact surface does not slide can you see that therefore between the ball and the and my palm the f the interaction you should recognize that this I this interaction is static friction not kinetic friction uh, <coughs> now probably uh, if i go to to um, um, well subjects associated with uh, with uh, uh, motorization with cars uh, you will you will uh, recognize it uh, recognize it better um, th we have set and device a certain system in our cars which makes sure or, or tries to maintain the interaction between the road and uh, tires to be static friction what is that system ABS anti-lock uh, 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 anti uh, brake system correct yeah because uh, <laughs> that system the purpose of this system is to maintain friction static friction between the tires and the and the road rather than kinetic although the car is moving so make sure that you do not associate motion of the object with static friction what do you have to associate it with sliding of the contact surface correct now within certain uh, certain limits uh, I mean fric uh, static friction adjusts itself in certain limits you cannot increase static friction and actually this is what anti-lock brakes do because of that limit uh, so so anti-lock brakes maintain uh, this this condition uh, the largest possible uh, frictional force is proportional to the normal so, so depending on this how strong the two surfaces squeeze against each other the static friction can can be larger now can be not is make sure that you recognize that there is no equation here the relationship between the normal force and static frictional force is inequality all right so now we have three uh, uh, th we already discussed three forces or three types of interaction gravitation uh, on the microscopic scale gravitational force normal force and static frictional force and well i want you now to look at me and imagine a free body diagram or a, a force diagram in other words identify all forces exerted on me 
So, now when we identify the forces, you remember that we have to answer those three questions. What are they? What, uh, what is the origin of the force? In other words, which object exerts the force? What is the force exerted on the target object? And nature of the force. I buy that. What is the type of interaction? All right. So, at this point, well, we have me and all the, others, uh, all the other objects around. And at this point, you know only three interactions. Gravitational interaction, you can refer to this as weight. I buy that. Uh, uh, normal force and static frictional force. Now, try to determine, I mean, at this situation, what forces are exerted on me. In other words, let's draw a free body diagram for me. I'm a particle for a moment, for a, for a time being, so I will mark myself here. Tell me what forces are exerted on me. Weight, correct? Let's, I, let's answer those three, check if we can answer those three questions. What exerts the force? The Earth. The earth. Not gravity. Gravity that has no shape and no color. <laughs> correct. So it is exerted by Earth on me. Due to? Gravity. Correct. I buy that. All right. Let's look for something else. Normal force. Right? I am in contact with the rigid surface on my, the bottom of my shoe, which is part of me, is in contact with the floor. We can suspect normal force. Uh, now, uh, which direction should I mark that force? Why? Because it's perpendicular to the floor. It's not because it is trying to overcome or oppose weight. It is perpendicular to, to, my, uh, to the uh, floor. I mark it like that. <sighs> okay. And the next one? Not static force, but static frictional, static frictional force. All right. Uh, uh, let's check if it is uh, if, if we are thinking right. So, who exerts it? The surface of the floor, surface of the floor on you. me due to friction. friction. Correct. Static friction. All right. Which way? Let's mark it to the right. A what? No. No, you don't have to have a movement. Now, static frictional force and normal force adjust themselves to the situation. All right. Uh, now, <coughs> recognizing that the classroom is an inertial reference frame, the net force is, go is equal to my, uh, to my mass multiplied by acceleration which means that these three, three forces have to add up to zero. zero what? What zero? Zero vector, correct. Uh, they have to add up to zero vector, do they? I mean on, the, on, the di on this drawing. He says no. Who agrees with him? What's your name? Sam. Sam says that they don't add up to zero, and indeed they don't, right? Because I mean I see that if I add these two, I will get an arrow like that, and then at the third one, so the net force is going to be somewhat like this, which means that I should accelerate this way. <coughs> now, we can actually uh, uh, find out the values of those forces very formally. How about if we introduce, uh, if we perform appropriate calculations, in order to, rather, rather than imagining, because I see that some of you don't have imagination. Sam has, uh, and can recognize from the uh, uh, geometrical consideration that they don't add up to zero. 
but if you don't see it uh, geometrically, let's do it by brute force and, and calculate it. Uh, I, I, I suggested that when, whenever you calculate or perform certain calculations on, uh, uh, on vectors, then it's much easier to do it when you know scalar components. So how about if we assign scalar components to it? You had a problem, uh, this type of similar problem in a, on the test, which a lot of you did not uh, do right, because in order to assign, before we assign scalar components, we have to make our mind about something. What? How do we assign scalar components now to these three arrows? We have to introduce a coordinate system, correct, a reference frame. How do you want to do it? Make it smart. All right. And axes, like that. This way, this way, and that way. No, this won't be good. Complicated. Well, let's make it, for example, that this one is one direction. What do you want to call it? X, let's call it X. This one, another direction, Y. And this one will be Z direction. So, uh, what are uh, scalar components now? Why don't we write each of those vectors? I mean, in principle, actually, I should, should uh, put here a triad of scalar components. And a triad of scalar components. And here, the triad of scalar components. All right, what should I? I can quickly find out that some components, I mean, this coordinate system was convenient because we immediately know a lot of those components, right? So what is Z component of the normal force? Zero. zero. Uh, X component? Zero. zero. All right, over here, I don't know, so I will just put and why? When you are uh, when you are a little bit more skillful, you could recognize that that y component is going to be equal to uh, to magnitude. But right now, how about if I just write and why? All right. Now for these, we also know two immediately. Y and z. And for for x, I will write f s x. Now how about for this one? zero and zero and this one and actually uh, I can relate it to my mass immediately yeah, so 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 whenever you have weight weight is not smart it has always fixed value it does not adjust itself so I can write down that this is y component of my weight oh how about if I write it this is y component of my weight or how about if I relate it to my weight actually I, I prefer to write it in terms of my weight uh, yeah, so my, my weight is, uh, uh, let's say that it is uh, about two th that's 200, 2,000 uh, newtons, approximately. So if it is 2,000 newtons, what number should I put here? Negative 2,000, correct. I will just write it down that this is minus my mass times uh, ac uh, acceleration due to gravity, although I refer here to the magnitude of acceleration due to gravity. All right. Now, what is the situation? My acceleration is zero, which means that if I add those three forces, I'm going to get zero. All right. Let's now find out what is the expression for the net force, scalar components of the net force. I have to add uh, them. Well, so I have zero plus x component of the uh, of frictional force plus zero so that's it now for this one i have y component of the normal force plus zero minus mg and for the third component i have zero plus zero plus zero and if i'm standing this force is zero force, zero vector, right? Which means that this is zero, this is zero, and this is zero. All three components are zero. Well, I see that the third component agrees. It's fine. 
Well, <coughs> now, how normal force has to adjust to result in a zero vertical component of the net force? How? Normal, y component of the normal force must be equal to my weight. I mean, my, uh, so, so it should be 2,000 newtons, right? So, so normal force is 2,000 newton up, newtons up, weight is 2,000 newtons down. How about frictional, static frictional force? What, how this one should adjust? Just to zero, correct. When I'm standing still on a flat surface, static frictional force is going to be zero. Now that it is not equal to the product, it, it's not equal to the uh, coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force, because yeah, for me it was 2,000 uh, newtons. Uh, let's say the, stat the st uh, static frictional force between this floor and me is, let's say, one half. So it is zero over here. All right, now, <coughs> Is it possible to have a situation that, that the normal force, yeah, because right now we can recognize that, that the uh, free body diagram should look like that. These two forces must to be opposite and static frictional force has to uh, be a zero vector. Um, and actually whenever Whenever I do not accelerate in a horizontal direction, static friction has to be uh, zero. Now, is normal force always in, in, on, on the floor is always equal to weight? There are situations that it isn't. What are the situations? Yeah, let's say that I want to pick up something from, from the floor. Now let's say I drop something. How should I do it now? Now, in other, well, I see that I have to move down, right? I have to move down. The only way that I can move is that the objects around me will push me in that, or, or pull me in that direction. I have to, pu to ask objects around me to accelerate me in this direction. Well, <coughs> Can I, uh, I cannot, I mean, Earth is pretty stubborn. I cannot ask, well, Q could do that, well, increase gravitational constant, R right? In other words, Earth, please pull me stronger. Uh, <coughs> it doesn't do anything. However, I can ask the floor. If I now bend my, if I bend my uh, feet, uh, legs, I actually reduce the normal force between uh, between the floor and the shoes. So this normal force now becomes smaller. If the normal force becomes smaller, what is the net force now? It's not zero and it's directed down. So my body accelerates up. Now let's say that I'm already here and I want now to go b up there. How do I do this? I have to ask the floor to increase the normal force on me. Really, I'm, I am pushing a little bit stronger on the, on the floor. So, depending on, on this, what I want from the floor, I push it, I, I change my shape in such a way that either I push it stronger or, or less. And according to Newton's third law, the floor reacts immediately. And it exerts a greater or smaller force on me, and I get it. All right, now, how can I get out from this room? I have to ask the floor to push me that way. How can I do that? Yeah, I push, I will push, 
I'll try to push it, yeah, because I mean push it. Uh, push me. Stronger. How strong has, is he pushing me? No, because I'm not allowing it. Yeah, so so that actually it, it is really interaction. It's not that one object uh, is active. Both objects have to be active. So although we change the shape, the floor has really to be kind to want to interact with us. On a, on a slippery ice, you <laughs> try to, to convince it to, to push you using static friction. It doesn't want to push you, and, and you cannot you can't do it. Yeah, because I remember when I was a, a teenager, <laughs> and I, I already learned about Newton's second law that, that uh, uh, the net force is equal to uh, mass times uh, acceleration of the object. So I thought that how come, <coughs> yeah, because I, mean, I, I knew that I can, I can apply force of uh, at least 10 newtons to throw objects. And I thought, <coughs> well, so if I take a, a, a very light object, I should give this object such an acceleration that I should put it on the orbit. Uh, and, well, how come that I couldn't? Well, it is because, well, I did not realize that I was able to apply a, a 10 Newton force to an object which really resists me, doesn't want to move. Or so, so if I had a heavy stone, I could apply 10 Newton force on that stone, but on tiny pebble I was unable to, to exert such a force because that pebble didn't allow me to do. It would so this was the reason why I could not put that pebble on the on the uh, on the uh, on the orbit or on the moon. All right. Now, so if I want to go out, how the how the free body diagram should look like? Yes. Yeah, so now we will have to have a friction, static frictional force in this uh, in the direction in which I want to to accelerate. Now, to what value normal force would have to adjust? It would balance with Opposite to the weight. And now, uh, uh, JD, how do you see that? Because you're not going up or down. So what? Um. Yeah, because I'm not. If I w I want to walk there, I don't I don't go up and down. Yeah, so I don't walk like that. If I walk if I walk like that, then the normal force would have to vary as well. But if I maintain actually walk this way, so uh, uh, <coughs> what says that the vertical component of the net force has to be zero? Vertical component of acceleration, correct. I, when I want to work over there, I want only to have a horizontal component of acceleration to be different than zero. Vertical component, I want to maintain vertical component to be zero, and because frictional force doesn't have a vertical component, then these two have to add, add up. Vertical component of these two uh, forces have to add up to a, a zero number. Uh, all right, now, <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when, you, when you analyze a free body diagram and, and use Newton's second law, you could do it two ways. Uh, I, p personally, I, I prefer actually to, to think about uh, um, all uh, components simultaneously. I could, I would call it that it is uh, uh, <coughs> serial processing of data. Like, like in a serial, uh, sorry, a parallel processing of the data. Like in a, a parallel port of a computer. Now, you could also uh, think about each component separately, but you have to think about each component separately, one after the other. This would be a serial processing of data, also like a, a serial a communication port, one after the other. So it doesn't matter if you write equations using arrays or you write columns for X component, Y component, and Z component, or even blocks, X component, Y component, uh, and Z component, but remember that for uh, analysis of vectors, 
you always have to consider three equations. All right, so this will be all for today, and tomorrow we'll continue a uh, discussion about forces. Thank you very much. Wait, wait.